Welcome back. Before we get started, well, you know the drill. Like, subscribe, comment, share, all of which can be done down below. If you do, you'll feel better about yourself and I will be very grateful. Mahalo. Welcome to another edition of A Moment of Tiki coming to you from the Lagoon of Mystery, my home tiki bar here in Central Texas. Uh, today, I am going to revisit some tiki lighting strategies that I have. Uh, in particular, the shade that I designed for my ceiling fans here in the Lagoon. I have a friend who has a tiki project that's going on fairly ambitious one and he came to me and asked if I could make some shades similar to what I have here in the lagoon for some lighting that he has in his tiki space and yeah I jumped at the chance the guys great and I am more than happy to help out so I was thinking yeah I kind of went over how I did these back what like two years ago with uh, tiki lighting episode, but those were just stills that I pulled from my blog, which I had been doing at the time. And I thought this was an opportunity to really go in depth and go step by step and show how I made these shades. Because I have had numerous people email me and reach out to me on social media asking for advice on how to make shades. Uh, they've adapted them for upright lamp shades, uh, combine the two for hanging lights, different things. So I thought there is the interest out there in this particular type of uh, bamboo and tapa cloth light shade. So without further ado, we are going to do a deep dive into making these shades and hopefully you will find it of use and interest. To make these light shades, I am using bamboo embroidery hoops. This is an eight inch hoop. I separate the outer and inner ring and apply a liberal coating of wood glue. I reassemble the two hoops. Then I use the adjusting bracket to tighten it and seal them together. Next, I take one of the 12 inch hoops, tightening once again and wiping away any excess squeeze out as soon as they're fully dried, in about 24 hours, we can start building the shade proper. With the glue dried, it's time to remove the uh, metal clasp here holding this the outer ring together. Uh, to do that, I unscrew this bolt threaded through there, and I use a pair of pliers to peel this uh, metal strip off the rivets and the result is you know a smooth outer ring now to prepare it for the bamboo uh, support struts on the outside I need to drill holes but before I drill holes I need to bisect the bamboo hoops so that all the holes are equidistant. And to do that, I'm just using a Sharpie, fine point Sharpie, straight edge. I'm setting this up and just eyeballing it. Lining the straight edge here, marking that side and this side both with the marker so that shows where two of my holes are going to go and I turn the hoop 90 degrees and do the same thing. I'm going to set another pair of marks 90 degrees to the first pair. Now I've got the cardinal points of the compass north, south, east, west. I'm going to have eight bamboo supports on each 
of these light shades. So again, I'm going to rotate 45 degrees now and repeat the process so that each of these marks is halfway between two of the previous marks that I made. So whereas the first were north, south, east, west, these will be northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest. With the bamboo hoops marked with the equidistant uh, guidelines, I'm going to bring the drill into play and I am going to drill, I'm using a fairly narrow bit, uh, drill bit, and I'm going to drill two holes straddling those guide marks. Right, right center of the hoop. And I repeat this for each of the guide marks. Straddle it with two holes. Here you see the nice big pile of bamboo combs that I have cut and torched. These will be put to good use with the light shades that I am making. Now, I have to take the bamboo columns that I have torched and rubbed down and cut them into nine and a half inch lengths. That is what I've calculated will give me the depth on my shade that I need to cover up the light bulb that it's going to obscure in disguise. Uh, nine and a half inches is roughly 24 centimeters for the rest of the world outside the US. So what I'm doing is measuring out that length, taking some masking tape, because what do we know? Bamboo loves to splinter. And I am wrapping the calm piece of masking tape. Once I have the tape in place, the tape will help prevent the backside of the cut from splintering and tearing out when I cut through it. That's why. And I'm taking the Sharpie and marking the nine and a half inch or 24 centimeter mark on the comb with that mark and tape. I am using my jigsaw with a fine blade on the end. You could use any type. You could use any type of saw with this. You can use a handsaw, a fine tooth handsaw. And if this was just for a few of them, I probably use that rather than pulling out the power tools. Uh, you can use a table saw. You can use a, a miter saw, any type of power saw. I'm just using this because it's most convenient for the task. And here we go. It's a nice fine cut. The tape, masking tape, prevented any tear out on the backside, and we're good to go. Now I just need about, what, 80 more of these, give or take. Next, I need to drill out my bamboo struts. These are nine and a half inches long. I measured out how long I needed them to be to get the depth on my shades and then I added an inch on either side. So I'm taking my ruler, my straight edge, placing it here and marking one inch from either side. Then when I have one inch marked from either end, I flip it over and on the opposite side, I repeat. Now this is same as we did for the bamboo hoops. On either side of the guide mark, we're going to drill two holes, side by side, a pair. A drill press might make this easier, 
but uh, I don't have a drill press, so we uh, do with what we can. Now, see how fun that was? They're going to do this seven more times. There are going to be eight bamboo support struts that are nine and a half inches long for each of my shades that I'm making. Now, we've got some good amount of rain coming down here at the lagoon. Of course, I'm dry underneath, but uh, if you hear anything in the background, uh, that's my very realistic take on Don the Beachcomber's entire uh, rain storm uh, special effect. What I have here is black jewelry wire. It's really thin copper wire with, I guess, a little even thinner vinyl coating. Uh, I'm cutting a four, maybe five inch segment of this, and with that segment, I am threading through the pair of holes that I just drilled into the bamboo. Get one through, then bend the over, other end, and thread through here. Ah, got it. Once you have it threaded through both Pull it tight so you have equidistant wires sticking out the side and then we're going to take it to the hoop that we drilled out earlier and thread those wires through the paired holes if we can. There we go. All right, once we have both wires through, we're going to take them and twist them. Don't over tighten because as this is very thin wire, it can break and it will break. Ask me how I know. So you want to tighten it enough so that the bamboo piece is not going to go anywhere, but not so tight that it's going to snap from the tension. And we do that eight more times for the top and then repeat the process for the bottom eight more times. I have the four main uh, bamboo supports on the side ready to go. It's going to be eight all together, but four is all we need for this step I'm going to take. Well, I mean, you pretty much know what's coming next, right? As before, we pull them both through. So they are of equal lengths, give or take. Now we take the six inch bamboo hoop and we thread this through. Oh, we're trying to, here we go, here we go. And again, repeat the process. Grab and twist so we are tying it so it's tight, but not overly stressing the wire so it will stay solidly in place, but not break. And the basic frame is complete. So the wires on here hold the bamboo links in position and space out the bamboo hoops, but this is super thin wire and it's not terribly strong. It can't hold a load. It'll snap fairly easily. So it also doesn't look good. But what I'm doing is taking sisal twine. I like sisal twine more than jute twine because one, it's stronger. I think it's easier to work with. And uh, ultimately it's gonna look a little better. Pull out about five feet five foot length, that's a little less than two meters for the rest of the world, that's not the US. And I'm taking this length and I'm going to crisscross 
loop and tie it into position. So this is essentially lashing the bamboo piece to the hoops. And I do this for each end, crisscross over, under, over, under. So <clears throat> one good thing about the sisal twine is that you can pull it fairly tight and it's not in danger of snapping. And ultimately the sisal will cover up the little piece of wire on the outside and disguise it. So aesthetics are always something worth keeping in mind when you're working with these type of kiki bamboo constructions. So, all right, and when you have when you're down to just about two, three inches of length, uh, six centimeters or so, then take it and tie it off in the back. Another nice thing about this sisal is when you knot it, it doesn't, it, it has friction so it grips, it doesn't immediately start unraveling. So I make a square knot, pull it tight, and then I do one more knot on top of that. So it's like a square and a half knot. And just repeat until I've got every end of bamboo lashed tightly onto the hoops. Now the bamboo hoops themselves are not terribly attractive, so I want to cover those up. And this is where we get to perhaps the most time-consuming uh, stage of this. I'm going to take the sisal twine, just knot it right along the hoop. And once I have it knotted good and tight, I'm going to start looping. Loop and loop and loop and loop and loop and keeping it pulled fairly tight. We are going to loop all the way around each hoop, top and bottom. Once we get all the way back around here, we're gonna tie it off and we'll be good. Now, as we finish wrapping, entire part. I'm going to take the final loop. You can see it here and cut it with uh, two inches, uh, five centimeters or so. Okay, pull it tight and with the extra that was left over after we knotted at the beginning, we are now going to tie these together. A basic square knot right here to secure the ends. And there we go. Now to ensure the knot stays stable, I like to come and hit it with a little dab of goop. This is a plumbing adhesive. Uh, I like it because it soaks into the rope or the twine and when it dries, it is dries to a flexible rubbery consistency so it doesn't get brittle and break apart. And that'll just stabilize the knot so it doesn't pull loose. With the frame of the light shade fully tied now, fully wrapped with the sisal twine, uh, it's time to torch it. I'm going to just use this hand torch set on very low. This fabric, the, the twine has a lot of fibers coming off of it, makes it messy. 
torching it will remove those fibers and also add, uh, well, carbonize it, scorch it, and give it a patina of age, which uh, enhances the aesthetic value. So just light it up. Don't, you do not want a powerful flame because you don't want to set the whole thing on fire, but just sweeping it over, just kiss it. The fibers are extremely flammable, so they go up very easily, leaving a little brown and black patina of soot. And you may need to go on the inside and do the back too. You want to get all those fibers burned away. And once you get one side done, it's time to flip it over and do the underside. To get the fabric that's going to form the shade on the inside of this bamboo frame to the right size and proportions, I'm going to use butcher paper, just basic run-of-the-mill butcher paper. I've already pulled off a roll. I'm going to insert it into the hoop so I can make it conform to the cylindrical shape. Once I have it in position, I'm going to take some scotch tape, or any kind of tape really, to tape the cone so it holds its shape. And once I have it stabilized, I'm going to take Sharpie marker, and trace along the edges so I can cut the pattern out. Here we have the pattern. Once it has been cut out from the butcher paper, you can see it's curved to follow the form of the cylinder. Fits right in there. You probably can't tell from the video angle, but trust me, it does. So we're going to set the frame aside. I have it marked outside and inside because it's not interchangeable. Now I'm going to take my fabric, some of the scrap fabric that I found at a estate sale slash yard sale. I like the pattern. Put into position. I'm going to mark it again with the Sharpie. You can tape it down to make sure it doesn't move, or you can just freehand it. With the pattern marked out. Scissors and it's time to cut. And we have the shade cut out. This is the red. Not only do I have the red fabric, and multiple colors, teal, a purple, lavender, and an amber. Now, you'll notice this is really flimsy, has no structure. So for these are much more durable or, or rigid, I should say. I coated them with shellac for the purple and the teal, 
which amber would clash with and, and, and mute the colors, I went with clear shellac and with the yellow slash amber color, I used amber shellac to enhance that and it makes it pretty stiff. Here's the thing about this fabric. It's woven and light shines through it. Even though it's a tight weave with fabrics, it's not in and of itself a great uh, diffuser of light for a light shade. I mean, you don't want to look up at the shade and see the bulb shining through. So we are in need of a diffusion material. <clears throat> so what I'm using is Pellon, Pellon uh, interfacing. You can get it at any craft store, fabric store, you know, uh, Walmart and other places carry it. And this is a non-woven interfacing, which basically gives you a translucent, stiff backing for the light shade fabric. This is used in sewing to stiffen collars and basically give form to fabric that isn't very rigid. Unfortunately, it comes in white and I thought that that was going to be uh, draw the eye from the underside of the light shades and so I attempted to dye it a darker shade so it would not be quite so eye-catching. You're going to go ahead and cut some diffusion backing for these pieces. And what I have done is go back and use my butcher paper to cut another template. This is a quarter inch shorter on all sides, so half inch either way. And we are going to place this here. And as we did before with the Sharpie, we will trace it out. We've got a cardboard base right here and my diffusion fabric, Pellon interfacing. I've got Gorilla spray adhesive. So I'm basically going to spray the spray adhesive onto the interfacing. Now we wait a couple of minutes. The shade fabric right here. We've waited several minutes for the glue to become tacky. I'm going to position this onto the fabric. Right here. Just like that. Once the adhesive is fully dried to ensure the diffusion layer, which is the interfacing, is fully connected to the outer shade, now it's time to attach it to the frame that we have. Now, this is decidedly low-tech. I use this goop glue, which is rubbery and flexible, and that's it, essentially. I'm going to go through and put globs of this on the high points. Each knot in here, where it's going to come in contact with the fabric, and then I'm going to position it in place and then anchor it with some stick pins. Right. The top and both at the same time, top and bottom. This really is super low tech. 
slide this into position down here. Try not to get it stuck up on any of these spots of glue. Want to position it so it's not hanging down very deeply out of the bottom. The top part doesn't matter so much. It's being held in place by just the sticky adhesion force of the glue. I'm going to flip it over, make sure what we have, and I'm going to bring in the stick pins. Piece right here. And the stick pins don't have to go into the bamboo itself. They just have to connect into the rope, the twine, just enough to hold the fabric in place. And careful, they're sharp until the glue dries. And once all are anchored, each touch point is anchored on the bottom. I'm gonna flip it over and just secure the tops because it's out, uh, conical, the cone shape is, is flaying outward, flaring outward. The top doesn't ever seem to need quite as much attention as the bottom, but I'm gonna look and see any place where it's pulling apart, pulling off from the side, we'll add, add a pin, and this will hold it down, anchoring it until the, until the glue dries, and then it's not gonna go anywhere. Now there's one more thing we need to do to stabilize this. Well, I, you could probably get away without it, but see where the fabric overlaps here, there is a gap and I don't like that. So what I'm going to do is just take a needle and thread. And I'm just going to do a very simple in and out suture swip stitch to hold it together so it doesn't pop loose. And this is not Terribly complicated, not complicated at all. Any people who have sewing skills or seamstress or anything like that, uh, probably looking and staring at me in horror, but you know, whatever gets the job done, eh? And tie it off and you're finished. Simple as that. The shades are all completed and if I'm being honest, this is where things start to get a little complicated. When I made the lampshades for the fans in the Lagoon of Mystery, attaching it was pretty simple and straightforward. They were going to hang underneath kind of a globe light. So all I did was screw wires in there and loop it around the fan and it just dangled. Here, I don't quite have this luxury. I made a kind of a mock-up for my friend's location. And all the lights that these have to cover are flush with the ceiling with these kind of cages. So these have to go over the lights like this. My solution is to design a hook and spring attachment. Um, I'm using these uh, little extension springs. They're three eight inches wide by two inches long. Uh, some basic gate hooks and picture wire. Just regular wire that you would hang up picture frames. 
on the wall. Now to attach them, I need to take these eye screws and screw them into the lower bamboo hoop in this frame. I'm doing the lower bamboo hoop so it reaches up and the spring will give some snap and give so that I can stretch it out to hook and then the spring will pull the entire thing flush with the ceiling. This allows me some movement around there to get it into position and get my arms up there to hook but you know it is what it is. So the first thing I'm going to do is find the two support struts that are most equilinear or basically balancing out bisecting this circle circular shade um, because believe it or not my measurements aren't accurate most of them are guesstimate and so some of them are off they're not dividing the circle in equally sized pieces of pie and I'm thinking these two are so I'm taking an exacto knife any type of really sharp blade will do and I'm reaching in here and slicing just cutting a hole into the side of the fabric right adjacent to where these are screwed in, fastened into the lower bamboo hoop. You have to do this first because the second part with the drill, you know, I tried doing this first. I thought, well, I'll just be able to drill through the fabric because it's pretty stiff with my applications of spray adhesive and shellac and all of that you know no put the drill bit in there drill bit didn't cut it wrapped everything up and pulled all of the fabric off the frame and i had to start all over again so lesson learned i reach in here through the hole and I'm going to line it up and drill directly into the bamboo. That's the bamboo hoop that makes the bottom of the frame, not the bamboo that creates the support struts to the side. I do this on each side. Now, I take these eye hooks, position them, and just screw them in place. And it gets pretty tight, so you might want to use a pair of pliers to do the last final twists. Do this with both sides. Next, we take our springs. And a length of the hanging wire. Just twist this over and wrap it up easily right there. And another length.
So here's the challenge. I have this metal cage over the light bulb that I have to hook the spring onto. These are the hooks that I have to work with. Uh, relatively cheap little fence screen door hooks. Uh, the trouble is that there are a lot of curves here and these curves ensure that these will not attach in any stable way onto this metal frame. So I have to adapt it, uh, bend the hook into a more stable configuration. So the question is, how do we get from this to this? Well, there's no easy way around it. You got to use brute force. If you can get a pair of pliers, um, the heavier the better. Uh, big, heavy, massive, solid pliers have a better impact on this. First, you just got to squeeze it and flatten out the curve. Once you have the curve flattened out, you want to straighten out the hook part. Not entirely, but you want to get at least a 90 degree angle going. Once you have that 90 degree angle, what I do, and again, this is just me. This is the way I figured it out. This is not any written in stone way. If you know a metal smith and can do better than this, then by all means, follow their advice. Take the needle nose pliers and slide the hook up about the midway mark because uh, I want the arch, the dome of the pliers to form basically a mold and take these pliers, wrap these around and squeeze down uh, as hard as I can, wrapping that metal around the top of the needle nose pliers. Once I get that wrapped over so that the long piece the, the hook end is roughly running parallel, roughly running parallel to the shaft. That's what I want. You get that good fish hook look. Uh, the shaft is mostly straight and you got that hook that kind of forms a J. Since we've gotten the hook curved into our fish hook, now I need to shave off some of the metal on the outside edge so it can fit in the cage and not come into conflict with the bulb that is inside the cage. So to do that, I'm using a basic angle grinder. Just again, brute force. When you're messing with this, you need to uh, wear your eye protection. And I've also got some glass cleaner ammonia to cool the metal because it's going to get uh, pretty hot with the friction. It doesn't take a whole lot to grind off the metal, so don't overdo it. You just want to thin it out a little bit, and there we go. After attaching the hook to the spring and the spring to the hanging wire, now it's time to attach the hanging wire into the shade. so it can hang the shade in place. 
Slide it through the ring. And just basically twist it together. And there we have it. Two hooks ready to go. And this is how it's going to work. The frame goes in here. And reach. And fortunately, it's spring, so I can move this to one side or the other to give myself some extra working room and and there we go springs in place hooks in place holds the shade flush with the ceiling covering the lamp but one more thing we have to do, if you may notice, yep, there's big opening where you can see all the insides. I've got a plan to remedy that, maybe. Again, just making this up as I go along. What I have here is a very thin sheet of plexiglass. It's thin and cheap. Uh, thick plexiglass is expensive, but I was able to get this uh, relatively cheap cost by buying a uh, essentially disposable poster frame from Walmart and just pulling the plexiglass out of it. What I am going to do is cut a circle in the plexiglass and this is to go inside the shade and I'm going to try and color the plexiglass so it obscures the bare bulb inside. The smallest hoop that I used, the bamboo crochet hoop, was six inches across. I tried that. It's a little too big, so this is circle I cut out. Pattern is about five and a half inches. And basically what I'm doing right here is taking a sharpie, taking the sharpie and tracing the pattern of my circle onto this piece of plexiglass. nice circular area. Now, normally if I'm cutting plexiglass, I have plexiglass cutters, which allows you to cut straight lines in there. Unfortunately, this is circular and I had no luck doing that. In fact, I didn't have much luck with anything. I tried a pair of scissors, but plexiglass is too brittle. So scissors and tin snips would cut it, but it would also crack the plexiglass and leave it in rough, rough condition. So I am going to use my Dremel with the cutting attachment. This is probably not recommended, but again, necessity is the mother of invention. You want to run if, if you're going to do this and I'm not saying do this uh, but if you're going to be like me run this fairly slow at a fairly slow speed because the Dremel the speed of the blade will cause friction and the friction will melt actually melt the plastic here and it'll glom up and blech, so you don't want to really do that what I'm going to do is trace the outline I'm not cutting all the way through and then pop it out from the scored edges. And pop that off, pop this out, easy to pop out along the scored section. This next step may or may not be necessary, I don't know. In my brain, I think it is. We've got the very clear, very slick plexiglass. I'm going to hit it with a 
random orbital sander, you could use old fashioned muscle power, but you know, whatever's quicker. See, it doesn't take that much effort, and what it does, it roughens up the surface, gives it a little bit of tooth, a little bit of bite, and also makes it a little bit more opaque, uh, translucent, uh, to better diffuse the light, and get it ready for the next step. Now you're thinking, okay, what's the next step? Well, the next step is a thin coat of paint to match the color of the fabric to make the light output a little more uniform. Got some basic red Color Master Krylon right here. I have, I went through my garage and picked out the paints that I had. I didn't go out and spend any additional money on them to get uh, dedicated plastic adhering paints. That's one of the reasons why we went with the or random orbital sander to grid up the surface some to give the paint a little more surface to bite onto and uh, we're not going to go heavy just one relatively light coat because we don't want to block too much light just adjust the color of it okay okay we are back over here in my working area. The plexiglass disc has dried, and uh, now it's time to insert it. The reason, the reason we're going with a flexible, very thin plexiglass disc is because it is smaller than the area, than the opening into which it is going. So needs to be able to bend to fit in the available space and once it is in place theoretically gravity will hold it stable and we will get nice reddish light coming from the underside at least that's my theory we'll see if it works or not all right, now that these are done, it's time to start installing them. One, two, three, four, let's go. And here we are, all that work has uh, gone for something. In the undisclosed location, you can see my light shades are all in place with the colored filters. And I'm thinking they are quite fetching. Eight of them in total, which was a heck of a lot of work, but I think it's worth it. I think it adds to the ambiance and uh, well, perhaps you too will someday be able to come to this really, really cool, ultra-secret Tiki Lair. Until next time from the Lagoon of Mystery, aloha.
It's like, how did you know? <laughs> you know what's funny is I asked Jason about that because at home, we've, right. um, we've put the plexiglass on it. Yeah. And, um, and he's like, no, it doesn't bother me at all. So I actually like it. It so. bothered me. If he doesn't like it, he can pull them out, but it it was bothering me like it. seeing those there. So mm -hmm. I said, okay, we're going to do Crap. That's unfortunate. <laughs> 